Pontiac, Michigan. Thank you so much for everybody who's been involved in our DigiBat program so to try to get as much education out there as we can. A lot of times um, teachers can't get us out to their classrooms or, or major centers can't get us um, to travel as far as we need to go visit them. And so we now have these digital programs so you can have us in your classroom so easily. Um, so DigiBats this year, we're raising money to get um, free uh, digital programming in classrooms, especially those places that can't afford to have us out there. And so we're giving away these programs to um, schools and uh, school groups and um, and uh, nature uh, enthusiasts that don't uh, that wouldn't have us out normally. And so thank you so much. We're almost up to eight thousand dollars so far since eight o'clock this morning. Um, that's fifteen percent of our asking goal. Um, we're working on it. We're almost there. It's going really well. Thank you for everybody who's contributed so far, and for everybody else we're the more um, that you give the more we can give back and so we're able to go into classrooms and talk about these amazing animals like Tom here one of our Malayan flying foxes is the largest species of bat in the whole world and um, and Tom is one of our ambassador animals. He travels all over the United States teaching people about how important bats are, how they're important seed dispersers, they're pollinators. And a lot of bats, especially here in Michigan, um, all of our nine species of bats here uh, eat thousands and thousands of insects every night. And not only is that good for us, but it also helps out farmers and uh, saving money on pesticides, saving our, our environment from pesticides and those toxic chemicals. And so bats are super important no matter where you find them. There are almost 1,400 different species all over the world. You find them everywhere except for Antarctica. And everywhere they find bats, they're always doing something super important. So this Tuesday, we're trying to do something important for them, which is to raise awareness and bring more bats into more classrooms. So the more that you give, the more we can give to classrooms and to classrooms that don't usually get to have us out. So. By raising money, we're able to do digital programs just like this, where we give a tour of our facility here and you meet um, several different species of, of bats and we talk about how important they are and which ones and, and, and all their cool behaviors and, um, and it also, uh, it gets us out there and we get to talk to more people. So we're super excited to get into your classroom. Um, and depending on how much that you give today, um, you get to go home with either a choice of school that gets one of your programs or a little bit of bad swag to bring home with you. And so thank you, thank you so much for supporting us here at the Organization for Bat Conservation. A, a $100 donation allows you to submit a school for a free digital program. There you go. Don't there mind the voice. <laughs> So as a digital program, when we come into your classroom, we will have a virtual um, back and forth with your kids just like this. And so, um, so we can tour our facility here, and then we can take live questions. So any questions that your kids have for us, we can answer them right there back and forth. Um, and we can, um, all of our programming is aligned with the Next Generation Science Standards. And so if you need to have a little bit of a custom, customized program for what you're covering in class that, that week, you let us know and we'll make it happen. So, thank you so much again. Uh, again, this is Giving Tuesday. Uh, we're doing the Digibat campaign, and um, you can find it right at our at our website at batconservation.org. We got some questions coming. Oh, in. we have some questions. Awesome. So to begin with, are bats are, are bats native to certain locations? Yes, you find bats everywhere except for Antarctica. So there's almost 1,400 different species. Here in Michigan, we have nine species. In the United States, we have 43 species. And then when you get to the tropics, it explodes. There are so many out there. And so, yeah, so you can find pretty much, well, you can find bats in almost any backyard, except for where it's way too cold up there, or down there in the Antarctica. Are bats dangerous to humans? Oh, so bats you should treat, if you ever see a bat in the wild, um, bats are only as dangerous as any other animal that you come in contact with. So you never want to touch wild animals ever. Um, you don't know what kind of um, zoonotic diseases that they might be carrying or pathogens. And just like a stray kitten or a stray bat, you never ever want to touch any animals in your backyard um, unless trained and, and gloved, um, gloved appropriately. So uh, other than that, bats are not um, aggressive animals by nature. They're more curious than 
anything else. And as long as you're not trying to um, grab them or touch them, uh, we are predators to bats. We are much bigger than them. They do get afraid. And so if you were ever to touch any bat in the wild, they would probably try to either scratch you or bite you. Um, so they can be dangerous if they see you as a threat. But for the most part, if you're just standing um, and watching them, they're not going to come after you. They're not aggressive. They're not predators. We're not one of their prey items. And so, no, they're not really dangerous. As long as you just give them their distance, just like any other wildlife, they're perfectly fine. Are bats endangered anywhere? If so, why? Yes, I think it's about 60% of bats are now endangered, and they're endangered for many different reasons. Um, habitat loss, um, uh, pollution and pesticides, um, uh, just overpopulation of humans, not being able to share space with them, um, white-nose syndrome. White-nose syndrome is caused by, uh, it's all of the United States now. It started in, um, it's caused by an invasive fungus from Europe. It came over in 2006 to upstate New York, it got into our cave systems, it's a fungus that gets on their nose and their wings. It's itchy. And so our hibernating bats are actually struggling. We've lost millions of bats to white nose syndrome. Um, it's itchy and it disturbs them when they're hibernating and they wake up too early. They come out and there's no food and they end up starving. We've lost millions of bats to white nose syndrome at this point. Um, other than that, there are other places in the world where they're hunted for meat. Um, there are places that they're, they're considered pests because they eat fruit from a fruit farm. Um, in actuality, bats actually eat fruit that's super, super ripe. So if you take a peek here, the way that bats like to eat their fruit is way past prime for market. And so farmers, um, farmers can't sell overly ripe fruit like this. People won't buy it. And so um, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of fruit farmers assume that the bats are eating ripe fruit that is ready to go to market. But in actuality, um, it's overly ripe fruit that they like to eat. So, so yeah, bats are in danger everywhere. Absolutely. And they definitely, definitely need our help. Going on, what types of food do these bats eat? Oh, sure. So bats, <laughs> any food item that you can think of, there's probably a bat that eats it. So these bats here in this enclosure are all fruit bats. They're all our male fruit bats. So they eat bananas and mangoes and apples and... Um, and figs and fruit like that. There are bats that eat only insects. There are bats that eat scorpions. There are bats that eat uh, frogs. There are bats that are fishing bats, so they only eat fish. There are some bats that eat um, that uh, eat other bats and small mammals. Um, and so uh, there are bats that only drink blood, so they're sanguivor sanguivorous. They only drink blood. Um, so there's uh, if there's something to eat, there's probably a bat that eats it. Absolutely. Oh, these are fun questions. <laughs> yeah, they still keep going in, too. Uh, do most northern bats migrate for the winter time? Oh, so here in Michigan, I know that half of our bats stay here and hibernate here, and half of our bats um, migrate down to um, slightly warmer, warmer areas, and then they hibernate there. Very cool. There are, yes, there are migrating bats. Vampire bats attacking people is a myth, correct? Oh, so. Uh, vampire bats don't prefer human blood. Human blood is not um, easily digested by vampire bats, and so the only time that vampire bats will actually feed from humans is if there's no other mammal within a certain radius. And so, um, so vampire bats don't often feed from humans at all. Usually, they feed from horses, donkeys, pigs, or chickens. And so, um, so yeah, so vampire bats don't prefer human blood at all. We go in there to feed them every day. Our colony here at the or at the bat zone, and they never bother us. They've never, um, they've never tried to bite us or anything. They much prefer the cow blood that we give them. So, uh, yeah, so uh, every once in a while you'll hear a case that a bat uh, took a little nibble, but it very, very rarely happens, absolutely. And definitely not here in this part of the United States. Uh, aside from contacting wildlife rehabilitation organizations when we find a bat in distress, what can we do to assist in the efforts to conserve and protect bats? Oh, excellent. There are so many things you can do. Um, you can uh, put up a bat house. Absolutely put up a bat house. A lot of times uh, maternal colonies, the moms and the pups who come out in the springtime, they're looking for a nice, dry, warm, uh, safe place to raise their pups. And so, when we knock down their natural habitats, like dead trees, which is what they really want to be in, and when we knock down those dead trees, they're looking for another habitat to take advantage of. And so if you put up a bat house in your backyard, you're providing that, um, that alternative space for them to raise their pups. And especially with the decline in their populations now, they need to make sure that they can raise another generation um, to continue their population. So by giving them a place to raise their pups, 
perfect thing to do. Um, if you plant native flowers around that bat house, it will attract them. It'll keep your nice native uh, bugs nice and healthy, which will keep your bats nice and healthy. Um, so that's an option. Um, the other thing you could do is just talk about bats. Just tell, um, just start to change that conversation that we have about bats. A lot of people, when they talk about bats, they talk about rabies and they talk about um, blood suckers and they talk about all these crazy that they get caught in your hair and all these silly myths that we that we've heard our whole lives. But if we change that conversation, if we talk about bats as a huge bug population control. Um, they're a natural pesticide. They also pollinate over 300 different fruits that we would um, that we see at the market. So things like mangoes and bananas and peaches are all pollinated by bats. If you like margaritas, uh, tequila is also only pollinated by bats. So. They're the primary pollinator of, bat, uh, of uh, uh, the agave plant, which is where we get tequila from. So, yeah. So if we just change the conversation that we're having about bats, that helps them out more than anything else. Great. And connected, would it be safe to put up a bat box near your home? Oh, yeah, sure. Sure, sure. Um, yep, a lot of people get nervous about the guano, but it's just like any other kind of wildlife in your backyard, like squirrels. They go to the bathroom and it gets, um, it gets uh, broken down by, uh, by the soil and the rain and everything else in your backyard. But um, putting a bat house next to your house, uh, that guano will never accumulate in order, um, the, the only, uh, a lot of people get concerned about the fungi that grow on, fun, uh, on, um, on uh, animal feces when it's in your house. But if it's outside, it's well ventilated, that guano is going to get broken down and no problem. It's not going to grow any, um, any uh, harmful uh, respiratory fungi that usually happens. And so uh, it's perfectly safe to have them near your house, absolutely. Are bats warm-blooded? They are warm-blooded. They're mammals just like us. They have hair or fur. They give birth to live babies. They feed those babies milk. They don't lay eggs. Um, so they're mammals just like us. They're warm-blooded. They have exactly the same bones that we have, just their finger bones are way longer and their leg bones are way shorter. And give me a second to catch up here. Um, I recently became aware of wing-wasting syndrome in bats, but haven't been able to find a lot of info on it. What, if anything, can you tell us about this infection, and have any of the bats at OBC ever been affected by it? Oh, so wing wasting I'm not so familiar with. It sounds like that might be white nose syndrome because white nose syndrome does get on their wings. It's a fungus called Pseudogymnoascus destruct. If you've ever gotten ringworm, um, it's like a skin infection. It's a fungus that gets on your skin and it causes some, um, some, uh, um, some deterioration of the skin membrane. And so when you talk about uh, a wing wasting, that could be white nose syndrome. I haven't ever heard it called that before, but it's probably white nose syndrome. And what was the question about it? Um, that was just, what is it, what is it, and oh. essentially, um, yeah. what can you tell us about it? Yeah, so I think that that's white nose syndrome. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, why do bats fly at night versus during the day? Oh, so uh, bats are nocturnal. Um, Probably for a couple reasons. Of course, we don't know for sure. But um, bats eat many of the same things that birds do. So they eat fruit, they eat seeds, they eat bugs. Um, so while the birds are taking the day shift, the bats take the night shift. And so they don't have to compete as much for um, for that uh, that food that they're foraging for. So uh, oftentimes, like you wouldn't all want to go to the restaurant a restaurant all at the same time. And then you have to wait for a seat, and you have to fight over food, and you have to wait longer for food. If um, birds take the, the day shift and bats take the night shift, it just spreads out those resources so much more and gives a little advantage to the bats. And uh, let's see. I think we're, oh, uh, evolutionary, evolutionarily speaking, what are they traced back to? Bats. Oh, so um, well, it depends on who you ask. So there's two there's two hypotheses about this. So the one hypothesis is that they all came from one shrew, one ancient kind of a shrew. Um, because we even find some shrews now that will echolocate just like bats. But there are some scientists who argue that, um, that mega bats like this with um, big eyes and a long dog-like face um, evolved from a tree shrew as opposed to a ground shrew where microbats evolved from. So microbats are a little bit smaller 
um, you, uh, typically in body size. They have small eyes and big ears, and they all echolocate. And so we think, so, so it depends on who you ask, but, um, but the second hypothesis includes that the microbats came from ground shrews and the megabats like, uh, like Tom here um, evolved from tree shrews who also shared a common ancestor. So um, whether it's all on one branch or on two different branches, we're not quite sure. Uh, bats might have evolved twice, but it's all very exciting and all that research is super cool to read into. I think we yeah. have time for one more question. Awesome, bring it. Are, are bats social mammals? Are there clicks yeah. and does that ever result in fights between bats. Yeah. So there are some solitary bats that just hang out by themselves, but for the most part, they do hang out together. So, and they're they're very social. So these bats right here, especially this species, you can see these um, straw-colored fruit bats. These are all some young males, um, and they spend a lot of their day snuggling, grooming each other. Um, the young males especially, they love to play. Play is super important to animals. It practices skills and muscle tone that you're gonna need later on in life. And so when they end up playing, they steal each other's food. They, um, they wrestle with each other, they squawk at each other, um, and they'll, they'll spend a lot of time posturing. And if you don't know what posturing is, that's flexing your muscles. <laughs> so yeah, they do spend a lot of time. There are some species of bats that will help each other raise their young. There are some bat species that um, that uh, that cuddle with different species. So even in the wild, you can find different um, species of leaf-nosed bats hanging out together. Even the vampire bats will hang out with their close relatives. Um, and and um, uh, it, safety in numbers, for the most part, they hang out together because they can keep each other warm and they can um, they can protect each other from their predators. Uh, there can be uh, bats that, uh, the more bats that you have, the more alarm system that you have going on for predators that are sneaking up on them and things like that. Yep, so they're very, for the most part, bats are incredibly social. And um, every morning here at the Bat Zone, we find them all in one big cluster of fur in the corner. So. So, yeah, absolutely, they're very curious and very social. Well, thank you again. Thank you for supporting us in this Giving Tuesday and our, our plight to bring more uh, of this education into more classrooms all around the United States. Um, so thank you, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, just shoot us an email at info at batconservation.org. Um, and thank you so much. Have a great rest of your holidays that are coming up, and I hope everybody's safe and happy. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone.